Well, uh, it's 6.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. My name's Kelly. Um, typically, Kevin does host these. Um, unfortunately, he can't attend tonight. Um, he was pulled away on a family emergency. Um, so I will be your host for the evening. Um, I wanted to go ahead and thank the Division of Research and Economic Engagement, Marketing and Brand Strategy, and of course, WBGU for helping out to make tonight possible. Um, our event tonight is modeled after the International Science Cafe movement, um, which encourages informal conversation between scientists and the public. Um, the talk will be short, it's aimed towards a general audience, and will be followed by about 30 minutes of uh, panelists, which will be open to discussion between the speaker, the panel, and the audience. Um, our main presenter tonight is Dr. Robert Midden. Um, he, of course, comes with a PhD from The Ohio State University um, and is currently the lead on a scientific research group which investigates um, issues occurring within Lake Erie and, of course, other water bodies within the state of Ohio. Um, he will also be joined by co-host and co-presenter uh, Dr. Lauren Kinsman Costello, um, who is the lead scientist and coordinator for the Wetlands Monitoring Program. Um, and tonight, Dr. Midden will be speaking to you all about wetlands. Are they cost-effective solution for the problem of harmful algal blooms? Uh, please join us in welcoming him. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, welcome, everyone. And as Kelly said, we're going to be telling you a bit about a large collaborative effort to determine the effectiveness of a large number of wetlands for helping to solve the problem of harmful algal blooms which are a serious threat to our economy, our ecology, and our health. So uh, I want to start out by giving you a little bit of background. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with this problem. Here is a satellite image of the western end of Lake Erie. And those green swirls are harmful algae, uh, also known technically as cyanobacteria. This happened to be taken uh, in 2013 and was published the summer of 2014 uh, on August 4th, which was the last day of the period when the city of Toledo uh, had to go without their water because of poisons in the water from that bloom. But this problem is not limited to Toledo and uh, uh, the western end of Lake Erie. In fact, it is a global problem and exists in many places around the world where agriculture is practiced and the fertilizer that uh, promotes crop growth also promotes the growth of these harmful organisms. And in fact, uh, while the city of Toledo had its water shut down in the summer of 2014, the bloom has continued to be a uh, a serious problem and in fact the very next year it was even worse than in 2014 and uh, exceeded in terms of its intensity the scale that scientists had created in order to track its, its, uh, the, the amount of the bloom uh, and it's continued to be a problem ever since. And just to be sure that you are fully aware of and understand the significance of Lake Erie, uh, remember that it's shared by four states and two countries, uh, Canada as well as the United States. It provides drinking water for 11 million people. Uh, over 20 power plants depend on it, and in fact, that's one of the greatest uses of the water in the lake. 300 marinas in Ohio alone are uh, based on Lake Erie, uh, and as I think many of you are well aware, it's considered uh, throughout the world to be the walleye capital, one of the best walleye fishing areas. Uh, and indeed, it's, it's the most valuable freshwater commercial fishery in the world. The Great Lakes Fishery Commission estimates uh, it generates one and a half billion dollars of economic activity alone. And indeed, 40% of all the Great Lakes charter boats are located on Lake Erie, even though Lake Erie is only one of the five Great Lakes. And the Ohio's charter boat industry is the largest in North America. The uh, Tourism Economics Organization, which is one of the foremost uh, economic evaluation firms in the, the uh, world that's devoted to 
uh, tourism and recreation estimates that that type of activity on uh, the western, on the Ohio part of Lake Erie uh, generates about eight, almost $18 billion of, of uh, economic benefit uh, and over 115,000 jobs. So it's easy to understand why the state of Ohio is uh, very concerned about this and willing to devote a considerable amount of resource in order to solve this problem. Uh, but it's not just Lake Erie in Ohio. This is a photo of Grand Lake St. Mary's uh, that was taken uh, quite a long time ago. And you can see what a beautiful place it was. Uh, but this was taken then five years later uh, in the summer when it had, was totally overwhelmed by this uh, cyanobacterial bloom. Uh, you can see that it doesn't look particularly inviting for swimming or other kinds of recreation. And in fact, the Ohio EPA posted notices uh, warning that the water was unsafe for contact even. And so while you see that, that a person out there on a jet ski, that wasn't really recommended. Uh, people said that it had the odor of uh, some of the worst outhouses you've ever been in. And uh, it also uh, produced a high level of toxins, of poisons. Uh, it, by coincidence, was being uh, monitored that summer by uh, one of the students who had worked in my lab. I went down and visited and learned that they were collecting samples that had uh, levels of toxin above 2,000 parts per billion when the World Health Organization recommends that uh, you avoid it when it's above one part per million. And just in case you're not quite aware of where this is located, uh, Grand Lake St. Mary's is this blue blob here uh, just to the west of I-75. It's about an hour and a half or so uh, south of Bowling Green. And in fact, at one time was the largest human formed reservoir in the world uh, and still is the largest inland lake in Ohio. Uh, in, and in fact, they estimate the recreation and tourism industry on Grand Lake St. Mary's used to generate about $160 million of benefit. But you can, under, you can easily imagine that that has been substantially reduced by this problem. Thus, the willingness of the state of Ohio to devote a considerable effort to trying to uh, resolve this problem. Uh, and uh, there are th three major parts to what the state calls the H2 Ohio program, aimed at phosphorus reduction. Uh, there are three major state agencies that are involved. The Ohio Department of Agriculture is promoting the adoption of 10 what are considered to be best agricultural practices that science has found are likely to reduce the loss of phosphorus from farm fields uh, transported into the surrounding watersheds. We're not going to focus uh, a lot on that today because uh, there's a third part that uh, is more important for what we are doing. Uh, but before I get to that, I want to mention also the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency's role. Uh, they are focusing on improving household sewage treatment. Uh, often known as septic systems, and reducing the threat of contamination by lead in drinking water by replacing lead pipes. But this is the part that will be the focus of the rest of our story this evening. Uh, it's managed by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and involves the investment of more than $110 million for currently more than 120 different wetland projects that have been approved. And so we have 120 million, 120 wetland projects funded by $110 million involving 59 different conservation uh, agencies, organizations, and corporations. Uh, $4.3 million of that 110 million is devoted, <coughs> excuse me, to an independent scientific effort to evaluate the effectiveness of these wetlands for achieving the goal of phosphorus and nitrogen reduction. 
There are, will be over 15,000 acres of wetland and ecosystem restoration, draining more than 110,000 acres of watersheds, with 180 landowners involved in 90 threatened or endangered species that are dependent on wetlands uh, benefiting. In fact, wetlands have many, many uh, benefits beyond what we're going to be focusing on tonight. Uh, but the nutrient mitigation, the reduction in phosphorus and nitrogen transport or export into the watershed is going to be essential for achieving the, the solution of the harmful algal blooms. I'm going to turn this over now to uh, my uh, colleague, my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Lauren Kinsman Costello, the lead scientist for this effort. And she's going to be explaining uh, much more about the scientific aspects of this and the team that's devoted to it. Fantastic. Thanks, Dr. Midden. I'm really glad to be here. I'm coming from Kent State University. Um, I'm a wetland ecologist, and it's been a real privilege to be able to lead this group of um, scientists and students that are part of the H2 Ohio Wetland Monitoring Program. Um, the reason why the ODNR is investing so much in wetlands, um, many of you may have noticed wetland ecosystems in your environment, places where you've um, gone hiking or recreated, um, and noticed how they slow the water down. Many people call wetlands the kidneys of the landscape. Um, and that's true. Wetlands have a, a natural ability to filter the water. Um, uh, they can increase the depositing of all the particles and all the stuff that the water is carrying. And they can actually retain the kinds of pollutants um, that cause all kinds of contamination downstream, especially the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus that are necessary to grow our food. They're nutrients every living thing needs to live, but when it gets, when they get into places like Lake Erie and Grand Lake St. Mary's, they're too much of a good thing and they cause the proliferation of that harmful algae that form harmful algal blooms that Dr. Midden just told you about. However, uh, there's an important caveat here. Uh, although wetlands can be really effective uh, filters, sometimes every now and then, they can actually be a source of nutrients rather than a sink, especially uh, in the case of phosphorus, which is a nutrient that doesn't have a gas component. Wetlands themselves change over time. So a wetland that's really good at uh, cleaning up a certain kind of contaminant uh, one year uh, may not be as effective the next year. Um, and then a very, very important um, feature is that these two contaminants, phosphorus and nitrogen, with which both play really important roles in determining how big algal blooms are, how luxuriant they are, and how toxic they are, how harmful they are, um, they behave really differently. They're different elements on the periodic table. They have very different chemistries. Um, and the processes that happen in wetlands to clean them up and prevent them from moving downstream into Lake Mary's, or into Grand Lake St. Mary's or Lake Erie's are very different. So the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, when them and other uh, professionals throughout the state were kind of evaluating what practices should we be investing in to tackle this wicked problem of nutrient-driven harmful algal blooms, um, the one that had the greatest amount of uncertainty, while at the same time, one of the greatest promises because of its capacity to provide not only contaminant filtration, but all of these other new ecosystem services was wetlands. Um, and there's lots of different ways to restore wetlands. So that leads us to these research questions that our group is uh, hoping to answer with the data we collect. So we're wondering which wetlands of all of these different kinds of restorations are most effective for stopping nitrogen and phosphorus from moving downstream? Um, and can we learn from the restoration projects that are already in place to optimize wetlands in the future in terms of how we manage them, how, and, and how we build and design them in the future. Because a lot of these, these features really are built. They're, they're designed, they're structured. Um, and so what, how can we do better? 
So the Ohio Department of Natural Resources contracted with a group of scientists that are all members of the Lake Erie and Aquatic Research Network. This is a consortium of aquatic scientists from throughout the state of Ohio. Um, and I'll put in a quick plug. I highly recommend that if you haven't already done so, go to the Lake Erie and Aquatic Research Network website, especially if you are a student or somebody interested in getting involved in Lake Erie and aquatic research um, in the state of Ohio. Um, but anyway, we pulled together this group of researchers from universities throughout the state of Ohio um, to assess the effectiveness of all of these wetland restoration projects that the ODNR is implementing. And it's kind of a dream team because a wetland is an integrated system and every part of that system um, plays a role in what it does to nutrients. So we have soil scientists like Dr. Midden, we have hydrologists, we have plant ecologists, ecosystem scientists, people with deep expertise in water quality monitoring, um, and professionals to help us coordinate and manage all of our data. Um, and they're from Ohio State University, Bowling Green State University, University of Toledo, Kent State University, um, and Heidelberg University, and Wright State University. So all over the state to monitor wetlands all over the state. Our goal, uh, because when you when you think about wetlands, we could evaluate them in a lot of different uh, a lot of different angles. We're really focused specifically on how each of these wetland projects affects the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that's transported downstream. Many programs like this are really focused on phosphorus because of the role it plays in how big a bloom is, but we know more and more that nitrogen is playing a very important role. And also many of the restoration projects are not in the Lake Erie Basin. We have a lot of projects that are in the Ohio River Basin, which feeds into the Mississippi River, and the Mississippi River feeds into the Gulf of Mexico, where excess nitrogen drives similar harmful algal blooms but there, instead of creating toxins, the algal blooms uh, draw down oxygen and they affect the fish communities and sea life. It's called a dead zone. They call it a dead zone and they measure it uh, on the order of states. Like this year, the dead zone is the size of Rhode Island. So we're interested in both nitrogen and phosphorus, but we're really focusing on the net effect of the wetlands on those two nutrients. Um, I'm gonna let Dr. Midden talk about this great example. This is a really good visualization of what one of the actually now 141 ODNR wow. implemented uh, H2 Ohio wetland restoration projects looks like. And we have the, this picture in the following one just to give you an idea of what some of the wetland projects look like. Now, when you've got 141 wetland projects, you're gonna have a lot of variety. And so don't figure that they all look at all like this, but this is one example. This one happens to be on the Southwest side of Finley. Uh, it's part of the Oakwoods Nature Preserve, which is one of the most popular parks in the Hancock County system. And what you see are a variety of, of wetland pools in this photo. And here's some on the other side. This is the east side. What I just showed you was on the west side. Uh, and you can see, uh, I don't know how well you can tell, but some of these pools were already filled with uh, plant life of various sorts. Uh, even at this, rel this was a relatively early stage. This was even just about four or five months after the construction of this site was completed. It actually looks even uh, quite a bit different now because it's continuing to evolve. Uh, and now I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Dr. Kinsman Costello to uh, fill in a little bit about the biochemistry, biogeochemistry of wetlands. All right, yeah, welcome to Biogeochemistry 101. This is um, one of the classes that I teach. So as a biogeochemist, we draw on the sciences of biology, geology, and chemistry to understand how ecosystems and how earth systems work. And to understand how uh, wetlands remove nitrogen and phosphorus, you have to pull from all three of those. Um, so I'm going to give you the basics. There are so many processes that occur in wetlands that process nitrogen and phosphorus, and I'm giving you a high level of the major ones. So the most obvious one that many of you probably would think of, especially anybody who's a gardener that might add fertilizer to their, to their gardens to help their plants grow, right? Plants use nitrogen and phosphorus to grow bigger. Wetland plants do the same thing. So a large amount of the nutrients that enter a wetland can be taken up and actually stored in the plant biomass. Um, but 
Plants themselves, right, when they die, they decompose. We may, maybe met some of you compost, and you're very familiar with this process. Um, and so that means that it's not a permanent storage of nitrogen and phosphorus. It's not removing it from the system completely. If we really want to know where in a wetland most of the nitrogen is removed and most of the phosphorus is removed, and for the longest period of time, um, we have to look in the mud, which is my favorite part. I call myself a mud scientist. Um, so, and this is where there are some really important differences between nitrogen and phosphorus come in. So nitrogen, there is a microbial process that happens in mud that changes the form of nitrogen that plants use into a gas. It's called denitrification and it completely removes the nitrogen from the system. It's back in the air in an inert gas um, that really is, it's not moving downstream at all because it's in the atmosphere now and it's not harmful in that form in the atmosphere. Um, phosphorus on the other hand, phosphorus is is, is solid. It, it doesn't have a major gaseous form. So the phosphorus molecule, phosphate, which is the, the molecule that plants and algae use, it's actually really sticky. So it sticks to soil surfaces and it sticks to particles carried by the water. And so the phosphate in the water and the phosphorus on those particles can get buried. So basically phosphorus just builds up in the soil. Physical settling, burial, adsorption, that's how wetlands remove phosphorus. And what's interesting is that this denitrification process occurs best when there's no oxygen and that phosphorus removal occurs best when there is oxygen. So there's trade-offs in the processes that remove them. So how do we actually measure whether or not a wetland is gonna remove nutrients? How do we collect some data to understand how these wetlands are, move, are, are working? One really basic straightforward way to do this is to um, just think about the amount of water in and the amount of water out and think about it like a bank account. Right, so if you measure the concentration of nitrogen in all of the water entering a wetland, and you know the amount of water entering the wetland, um, and you do the same thing at the wetlands outflow, you can basically do what's known as a mass balance. Uh, you can balance the masses of nitrogen and phosphorus, just like in your bank account, uh, in a wetland nutrient mass balance, we want less nutrients leaving than going in. Um, if we have more nutrients leaving than going in, then the wetland is acting as a source. If we have less nutrients leaving than going in, then the wetland is acting as a sink, which is what we want. So we think of this as like the holy grail, because if we can estimate the total mass, the pounds of phosphorus or the pounds of nitrogen that that wetland is preventing from moving downstream per acre or per any wetland area, we can then compare the effectiveness of something like a wetland to the effectiveness of something like a cover crop or one of the other uh, best management practices that the H2 Ohio program is investing in. Um, we can also compare how a wetland changes over time and compare one kind of wetland restoration to another, which is really important in the context of our program because there are very different kinds of ways to restore wetlands. Some are more expensive than others. Some are more time intensive than others. Some take a lot more land than others. Um, there's some wetlands though, the caveat to that, that it's really, really difficult to measure everything going in and everything going out. And also if all we ever did was put that wetland in a box and treat it like a bank account without knowing what's going on inside it, um, then it becomes harder to actually understand how the wetland is doing what it's doing and use that information to optimize wetland restoration in the future. So in our monitoring program, in addition to that nutrient budgeting approach, we're opening up that black box and we're measuring all of the different components of wetland systems, especially in a couple of representative projects that we think are kind of flagships for certain kinds of restoration. Um, we're monitoring those really intensively to understand how much nutrients do the plants remove compared to the microbial denitrification? And how does that compare to the phosphorus removal by settling versus that phosphate sticking to the soil? Um, and that'll help us better understand in the future how to design and manage wetlands. So I keep saying this because it's one of the most important, one of the most challenging features of the H2O Ohio Wetland Monitoring Program, but also one of the most exciting ones. Um, 
as a scientist, if you were to come and ask me, right, design a program, design an experiment to understand whether or not wetlands are a good investment in removing nutrients, a scientist would never design a study like this because of how variable the wetlands are. Right. And, and in a way that makes sense, you can't put a wetland in a test tube. You can't make a wetland into a replicate. Um, so it's challenging because we have all of these different kinds of wetland restoration approaches. But what's beneficial is these are actual projects, the way restoration is actually being done. They're not designed by a scientist um, and they're, they're relevant to the way that practices are being done on the land. So we're getting a really good snapshot of so many different approaches to compare under a standardized framework. And as far as we know, there's, there isn't any other monitoring program like this. There's lots of programs monitoring individual wetlands here and there for nutrients, um, for what we're looking at. But there are very few, if any, that look at so many different kinds of wetland restorations. Um, it's a big job, but we've we've done a lot. We just finished up. So the, 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 the project started in about 2020. We kind of got our act together and made our plans. And 2022 was the first year that we really were collecting what we call routine monitoring. Enough wetland restoration projects had been constructed. We had our, our team together um, and we started collecting actual data. We visited over 50 of these wetland restoration projects, some of which have been completed, some of which we visited to collect data prior to the restoration construction. We collected 1,758 water samples to measure the nutrients in them and 566 soil samples to measure the nutrient content of them, which is an incredible amount of data, much of it due to Dr. Midden, thank you. Um, and we surveyed and sampled plants at 11 of these projects. Um, and that's a really labor intensive kind of data collection. So we've already built a really, really robust data set that year after year we'll add to and learn more and more about this population of wetlands. Um, yeah, and it's exciting because, you know, as a scientist, sometimes we study nitty gritty, gritty details about uh, processes occurring in the soil, invisible things that are fascinating. But this is such a rare and valuable opportunity to do science that's directly impacting how decisions are being made, how the Ohio Department of Natural Resources may choose among different kinds of wetland restoration projects and how some of our partners manage those projects after they've been implemented. Our hope is that with these data, we'll be able to basically increase bang for the buck, right? Increase the cost effectiveness by better understanding the role that wetland restoration plays in mitigating and preventing excess nitrogen and phosphorus from getting into places where it can cause harmful algal bloom. Um, yeah, and basically doing our best to maximize benefits and minimize cost because um, it's going to take a lot of effort to solve uh, the wicked problem of harmful algal blooms. And we think that wetlands can play a really important role. So thanks. Thank you very much. Sure there are a lot of really great questions. Yeah. <laughs> And we have uh, three students who have joined yeah. us uh, that are also involved with this in, in uh, multiple ways. Uh, with us this evening, we have uh, Braden Baumhauer, our graduate student in the School of Earth, Environment, and Society at Bowling Green State University. Uh, Braden uh, participated in quite a bit of our field work uh, while he was an undergraduate, and he uh, graduated, earned his bachelor's degree last year, and started the master's degree program in uh, geography here at, Bo at Bowling Green State University, and is working on a project aimed at determining the best locations to create and restore wetlands in Kenya, because Lake Victoria suffers from some similar problems. And in fact, there's a team from BGSU that has been there uh, in the past to study that problem and compare it to Lake Erie. So Braden Baumhauer is with us. Ibrahim Mohammed is a, a graduate student in the master's degree program in uh, the School of Earth, Environment, and Society. And Ibrahim is helping to develop a mathematical model that will describe the uh, relationships of water to all the different features of the wetland at that Oakwoods Nature Preserve site that we showed you a photo of. 
And then uh, an undergraduate who's working with our team and has been uh, a wonderful addition to our team this year. First year student Lucy Bissell is with us as well. Uh, Lucy is a first year chemistry major uh, and has already made very valuable contributions and will uh, continue working with us this summer, uh, helping with both field work and lab work. So um, I, I think it would be possible for uh, any of them to add any comments they would like to make regarding uh, this program if they would so choose to do so. I guess I'll start. I'm just trying to see what you guys are up to. Uh, I, great presentations. This is Braden ba Baum Baumhauer, by the way. Hi, guys. <laughs> so uh, I've been with this program for, oh man, two, two and a half years, maybe? Something along those lines. Uh, and it's been a whirlwind to see the program develop over time. I think I was here when it was like, what, 47, maybe 50 wetlands. Uh, and I don't think most of them were totally finished just yet. No. Like the first one I went to was fully finished. And now it's expanded to well over 100, and uh, I believe it's growing. And I think it's just kind of rare to see a, a program like this exist. I do believe this is the largest restoration project uh, in the United States. Am I wrong? But um, work like this is valuable because it teaches us something on a large scale wetlands are traditionally a site-by-site -site process and as such we can't really view the bigger picture and this is a rare opportunity to understand that bigger picture as wetlands are not just an isolated thing they are a small ecological uh, force that is interacting with two much larger forces which is aquatic and terrestrial and uh understanding that it's not just a small scale, but it's a much larger picture will help us probably paint uh, an understanding of how to solve uh, this wicked problem that we have here. Thanks, Braden. All right, so um, if, if either of the other two uh, panelists would like to make a comment, you're welcome to do so, but I think we also have questions and I don't, I'm not able to view those, so I'll rely on someone else to relay them. Uh, Ibrahim and uh, this is Ibrahim Mohammed, who I think you can see now, and Lucy. Oh no, that's Kelly. Hi, I think we're getting um, some of the panelists There's up on the screen so everybody can see. Um, we do have some questions um, in the chat, uh, so I can read those back to you guys when we get there. Okay. Um, just to leave the floor open to all the panelists to start. Of course, if anybody else has any questions while the panelists are speaking, feel free to drop them in the chat. You can message them to me directly if you'd, like, if you'd feel more comfortable with that. Um, but just to sort of open things up to the panelists, um, could each of you just like share a little bit about what your research is involved in? You know, what got you, you know, involved in what you do in the first place? Ibrahim? Yeah, hi guys. So I recently joined, I joined Bowling Green um, just last fall and started working with um, the H2I projects intensively this semester. I actually just did my TD proposal about two weeks ago. And so what I'm trying to do is to develop a 3D hydrologic model of the focal site, which is Pupu's Nature Preserve, just to try and then simulate the hydrologic and nutrient cycling pro processes that take place um, in that site. And the work is, my work is basically trying to supplement what the whole um, wetland monitoring program and specifically the base monitoring crew is trying to do in answering the question of how effective the wetlands are working in sequestering nitrogen and phosphorus loads. So my work is going to like take advantage of the ability of wetlands to produce continuous data in terms of water levels and nutrient concentrations and also to predict what future nutrient cycling and um, hydrologic processes would look like within the Oku's nature preserve. So in the end, the aim is to try and then not just apply the model to this um, particular site, but also to try and then um, repeat the same process to other types of uh, other wetlands within the H2 Ohio program, specifically the isolated wetland, because it's um, Oku's is kind of special is different from the other wetlands in terms of his hydrologic setting because um unlike the other ones which are connected 
to surface water bodies in terms of new um, water supply and then water outflow, Okus acts like a permanent sink for most of the water that gets to it because um, the only sources of water to that site is like precipitation and then subsurface tiles. And so far, very little connectivity to like surface water bodies has been um, noticed on the site. So developing a model to simulate the kind of processes that take place will be kind of cool to help us understand these kind of hydrologic systems. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. And indeed, the mathematical equations and relationships that Ibrahim is developing uh, will be extremely useful for our evaluation of that site, but we'll be able to apply the basic principles to all many other sites as well. And so it'll be uh, a very important component in our evaluation of the wetlands. Uh, Lucy, would you like to uh, speak a little bit about uh, why you got involved in the project and what your experiences has been like so far? Yeah, so um, I got involved in the project because I heard um, from one of my parents who works at BGSU that he was hiring students to do chemical analysis with H2 Ohio. Um, and I was just as a freshman interested in getting any kind of lab work um, that I could have. But, um, oh, like since I've started working there, uh, it's been really beneficial and I've learned a lot. Uh, and I've, I've kept working at this lab specifically because I really feel like it's nice to be in chemistry and be able to make a difference in, um, in environmentally because that is not always true with chemistry jobs. Um, and then what I do for H2 Ohio is I do um, lab work. So I assist in doing um, various chemical analysis tests on um, water samples, bio samples, um, like plant samples and soil samples. And we analyze um, the phosphorus and nitrogen contents in them. And uh, I, you notice that Lucy was involved even though she's only a first year uh, undergraduate student. Uh, I think that is in fact uh, the best way to learn science. Science, frankly, is not really textbook. Science is a sort of, uh, textbooks are a sort of history of science, but science itself is the process of discovery. And the only way you can really learn science is by doing it. And so uh, I've uh, tried to design the uh, research that we're doing in such a way that students can get involved at the very beginning of their college education because I think that's so valuable, so important. And Lucy is an excellent example of that. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the uh, questions and, and uh, see what, uh, what they are uh, wondering about. Let's see here. Um, so we have one, um, it's asking, what has been the main criteria to select a location of the wetland projects? And have the wetlands been established in hotspot areas? Good question. Uh, so the uh, criteria have included, uh, of course, an evaluation of the likelihood that that particular location is going to retain water, is going to retain uh, hold water, <clears throat> and that water won't just drain away, uh, considering uh, the construction that can be conducted. It also is based on affordability. Uh, you don't want to take the most productive farmland and convert it into a, a wetland because the wetland isn't going to be producing crops. And uh, you also uh, want to be sure that it's located in an area where uh, it'll uh, be likely to provide significant benefits to the watershed. And indeed, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, there are a few projects that have been selected to test the effectiveness of wetlands uh, to reduce the phosphorus in particular that's coming from what are sometimes referred to as legacy phosphorus farm fields. These are farm fields that have accumulated uh, very high levels of phosphorus in the soil. Uh, and uh, it's, there, <clears throat> there's been prior research that has established confidently that these types of uh, fields uh, contribute a much greater portion of the phosphorus that drives the blooms. And so there's a, a great deal of interest in uh, determining what can be most effective for addressing that uh, critical need. And there are a few projects that have been selected and designed specifically for that. 
In fact, there's one that we're involved with uh, that uh, is also a joint effort with a, a, a team from Ohio State University. Uh, and so we will be uh, determining how effective the wetlands can be at uh, that type of situation. One thing I want to mention, though, is that wetlands, as, and then Dr. Kinsman Costello did mention this uh, earlier, the wetlands change over time. Uh, they evolve, and they evolve in, in multiple ways. The vegetation, plant life evolves, the hydrology evolves, uh, sediment accumulates, and phosphorus and nitrogen, if it's being retained, accumulate. And there are some situations where wetlands uh, have been found to uh, absorb or retain phosphorus for some period of time and to reduce nitrogen export for some period of time. But then over time, as uh, the soil becomes saturated with phosphorus, uh, they can end up uh, even contributing phosphorus, <coughs> exporting phosphorus into the watershed. So one of our goals is to better understand all the factors that determine the nature of that evolutionary process, uh, the points at which the wetland might convert from a sink of phosphorus and nitrogen sink into a source, and also to understand how the structure and behavior of the wetland influences that uh, so that we might be able to identify management practices that can help restore the desirable function of the wetlands. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Dr. Kinsman Costell also mentioned that when oxygen levels decline, that phosphorus can be released. And in fact, we've seen this at one of our sites where uh, vegetation, dead plants, have accumulated near the outlet of one of the wetland pools and sunk to the bottom and decomposed. The process of decomposition uses oxygen, consumes oxygen. The oxygen concentration in the water in the soil drops, and when that happens, phosphorus can be released. But understanding that, we uh, can uh, consider the possibility of removing that decomposing material periodically and anything that might contribute to decline of, of oxygen and thereby restore the, that function. So that's one example of how understanding what's going on, not only recognizing when the uh, function of the wetland changes, but also understanding what accounts for it, uh, might lead us to be able to extend the lifetime of wetlands uh, improve their function, and also, of course, predict where uh, the best wetlands can be located and, and structured in the future. Any other comments about that? Uh, uh, another question, Kelly? Uh, let's see here. Uh, do you think that the frequency and timing of inundation will have strong effects in nitrogen and phosphorus sequestration and removal? Um, if so, uh, which process is the most important? Ah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> An excellent question, and we're hoping to be able to inform the answer to that question uh, from the, uh, some of the research that we're doing. Indeed, the timing of water flow uh, plays an absolutely critical role in determining wetland function. Uh, this last fall, a lot of our wetlands uh, dried up, or, or a number of the wetland pools uh, lost their, uh, their standing water because of relatively dry conditions. And of course, under those circumstances, we're not going to see uh, any retention of, of uh, phosphorus uh, or transformation of nitrogen. But then the question is what happens when you get that flood of water as we did then in January and uh, the wetlands are, are inundated? How has the dry period influenced the behavior of the soil? And uh, when you get uh, that first flow of water in the, in, after a, a winter thaw, uh, you often see uh, higher concentrations of phosphorus and nitrogen in the water. And, and so the question is, 
will we see more or less absorption, retention of phosphorus and nitrogen under those conditions uh, than under the, let's say, slower flow conditions that we have uh, mid and late summer? So while some things are known about this for sure, uh, there's a lot more that needs to be learned and that will be uh, some of the important issues that we're going to be addressing with uh, the research that we're conducting. Or anyone have anything they want to add on to that? <laughs> of course, a very thorough answer. All right, pluck another one then. All right. So we already touched on this a little bit, um, but before we continue on, I just wanted to touch on um, what sort of things would you suggest if people wanted to say, get involved with this line of work, maybe get involved with H2 Ohio, um, get out there, explore these topics, what would you suggest that they do? Well, that's a, a excellent question because it, uh, it, it provides a good opportunity to provide a little more information about the range of scientific expertise that we have involved in the program. Uh, Dr. Kinsman Costello uh, mentions that she's a biogeochemist. Uh, she specializes also in certain aspects of soil, nitrogen cycling, uh, and, and other aspects of how uh, the, uh, the living organisms uh, relate to the the soil and relate to the water and how that influences uh, what's happening. Uh, we have uh, uh, two teams, well, uh, one team here at BGSU led by two faculty that are uh, surveying all the plant life in an, a number of the wetlands, identifying the different kinds of plants that are present, uh, determining the amounts of those plants, collecting samples and then sending them to us for chemical analysis so we can determine how much phosphorus and nitrogen they contain. And then we can estimate the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen that's been absorbed by the plants as one way that the wetlands are retaining phosphorus. But as you heard earlier also, those plants do eventually die, fall to the bottom, and we have to determine what the fate of that is. Uh, but that plant team, the vegetation team, is working closely with another team with very different expertise. Uh, they fly drones with high resolution cameras uh, that uh, take images that have a broader spectrum. They, they measure light over a, a wider range of wavelengths than we can even see with our eyes. And they mathematically analyze those images in order to determine what all is present in the wetlands. And they're working closely with the vegetation team to determine what, how we can estimate the types and amounts of plants by using just those drone images. So they're relating what the, what's in the drone images mathematically to what the plant team is finding on the ground so that in the future we can estimate that uh, plant contribution more efficiently. There's another team that uses uh, ground penetrating radar and measurements of soil electrical conductivity and resistivity, three different techniques of geophysics in order to determine differences in soil types and characteristics, soil moisture, where the groundwater, where the underground water is located. Uh, and then uh, Ibrahim is working with Dr. Ganming Lu, who is a hydrologist, who is uh, helping to interpret the results of the geophysics and the other results and the other data that we gather on surface water flow and underground uh, water movement in order to determine the role of underground water as well as surface water in that transport. And, and then we have uh, a team at Wright State that is uh, measuring, as well as at Kent State, uh, Dr. Kinsman Costello and Dr. Sylvia Newell uh, are both measuring uh, the transformation of nitrogen in the soil in special ways. So uh, I hope this provides some 
indication of the range of possibilities, the, the range of different scientific disciplines that are involved, and uh, the range of different ways that people can be involved. If you want to be involved in this kind of research, uh, you could uh, be a, a biologist, uh, an ecologist, a hydrologist, a geophysicist, a biogeochemist, uh, a, a chemi an analytical chemist, uh, a variety of different kinds of scientists and, and, uh, and be, be able to contribute in valuable ways. I just want to add in addition to that great overview of all the different scientific things you can get involved in. Uh, this is a really unique opportunity to, to do science interacting with practitioners. So every single one of those 141 wetland restoration projects, right? The ODNR is involved. They chose it to fund it. And some kind of project partner is involved. Project partners include non-governmental organizations like the Nature Conservancy, um, land conservancies like Black Swamp Conservancy, West Creek Conservancy, um, pretty much every like county and metro park system in the state of Ohio. So anyone interested, if you're interested in science, but not necessarily an academic path, or even if you are maybe interested in an academic path and you want to ensure that you're doing science that's relevant and has impact, there are so many opportunities to get involved in the H2 Ohio program. We also have a lot of needs on the sort of technical and communication side. I wish we had a graphic designer on our team, things like that. So um, if you're a student on this call, you know, please get a hold of us. I put the email address of our research coordinator, Olivia, and of course you may have the contact information of Dr. Midden if you're at Bowling Green and you wanna look for an opportunity at Bowling Green. Um, if you're a community member, we are kind of beta testing some citizen science and community science endeavors right now. Um, and we're gonna expand on those more and more. So pay attention, find your local H2 Ohio wetland project. They're on the H2 Ohio website from the ODNR. Many of them are open to the public and you can explore them, um, get to know them. And hopefully in the future, we'll have some good frameworks that you know we, we want, we need everybody to help us collect these data. We need people on the ground watching them and helping us, not just, you know, we're all, we're all scientists. We are the ones who are fortunate enough to get paid to do it. Um, and, and we want to pay as many, all of our students to do it and things like that. But there's also lots of opportunities for community members who just wanna learn more and are curious. In fact, there are two ways that uh, the public can uh, participate. Uh, we are gonna be installing what are called staff gauges. Uh, these are simply large rulers that are uh, placed in the wetland that can be used to measure the water level. And there'll be signs that indicate how you can submit your observation of what the water level happens to be at that time. There are also places where there's a post with a platform where you can place a cell phone and take a photo and then submit that as well because photos taken over time can provide valuable data. So these are two uh, examples of what's sometimes called crowdsourcing data. Uh, and so one, is, one of these projects is in fa fact called uh, crowd hydrology. Uh, and, and we hope to have an increasing number of opportunities of that sort uh, for, for people to be involved. And, and of course, it's not just the H2 Ohio program. You can find opportunities like this in a variety of places, a variety of ways uh, throughout uh, the country. Uh, and I would encourage you to do so because it is one of the best ways to uh, make a contribution while also learning some interesting things about the true nature of science, which I think is really important. Well, thank you both for that very informative answer. <laughs> Um, I just want to point out to anybody, um, if you're interested, Dr. Kinsman Costello did post a lot of links in the chat um, to a number of different websites and people that you can contact. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, there are some good resources there. Uh, this one goes out to our panelists. Um, do any of you know if there are some good ways to get involved on campus with doing this kind of work? Yeah, I think I can speak on that a little bit. I joined through, I don't know if it's been stated, but uh, I and Ibrahim have been working under Dr. Dr. Gaming Liu, the hydrology team. 
And I've been on BGSU for five years. I was my undergrad. It's not my graduate. Uh, and the way that I got involved was simple. I took one of his classes. Uh, simply, you know, getting involved with your professors, uh, no matter what department you're in, will surely benefit you along the way as they'll share not only their wisdom and experience, but potentially present you opportunities. And Dr. Gaming Lu presented an opportunity to me that I couldn't refuse. Uh, if you're in science, uh, I believe that most majors in BGSU's case often require either like a small project or an internship. And I can promise you that H2O Ohio, if it offers a form of internship, it is a great opportunity uh, to take and I would recommend it quite highly. Second that, we have been limited from day one. Uh, we've, we've hired a lot of people across this program throughout the state. And there frankly just aren't enough people in the state of Ohio, probably in the Great Lakes, who have the different skill sets that contribute to a program like this. Environmental jobs are not going away. And these are not only fun, interesting roles, but they'll train you really well for environmental careers if that's something that you're interested in, in a lot of different angles. So and thank you for the plug, Brayden upvoted all the way by me. <laughs> I want to mention that we, uh, I, I described the faculty expertise, but we also have a lot of uh, technicians that are playing vital, critical, really important roles, if anything, more important roles than the faculty. Right. Let's be honest, they're doing a lot of the work. Yes. <laughs> and they're the ones who get to spend all day on this. We have all sorts of other things to do. Right. The faculty. Yeah, and I have to mention Corb Corbin Cohort, who is our research coordinator, and Jenna Hunt, who is our field research manager uh, in our team. But there are, uh, they are, uh, like I said, vital, critical, do uh, the, the majority of the work. And, and you could, you know, if you've got skills in, in any of these areas, uh, we hire people periodically <clears throat> and, and uh, and there are other projects like this that are also be hiring. So. All right. Well, we are getting up there in time. Um, did any of the other panelists have anything that you'd like to add? No. All right. Um, thoughts, final thoughts from anybody? Well, I, I want to mention how grateful I am for the opportunity to be part of this project. We have a remarkable team. I, I've, I've been involved in academics for quite a long time. Uh, I, uh, I got my undergraduate degree in 1974. And uh, I have to say this has been one of the most enjoyable teams of scientists that I've ever worked with. And I'm also grateful to have the opportunity <clears throat> to be involved because we have such a, an array of resources uh, in terms of these wetland projects. Uh, and we have, while we don't have a huge amount of funding, we have enough to do what I think is really important work. Uh, I am highly optimistic that we will be able to accomplish uh, some really notable advances in terms of understand, truly understanding scientifically the nature of wetland function uh, and the relationship to structure uh, in, in what I think could well be an unprecedented way. This is truly exciting for somebody like me and I think for everybody involved. And so I, I want to express my gratitude for that, but also my hope that the funding will be maintained uh, over the period of time that will allow us to make, uh, to realize the maximum benefit from the investment of these first few years of funding. Because as you've heard, wetlands do change over time and that change is really important. Uh, we've got to understand as much as we can about that change. Uh, and the only way to do that is to continue this investigation uh, now that we have this infrastructure established and this wonderful start uh, to our evaluation. Yeah, I agree with everything that Bob just said. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, well, 
that has been a great discussion. You know, thank you all for joining us. Um, of course, you know, both Dr. Kinsman Costello and Dr. Midden, thank you so much for coming and sharing um, all this information with us. Um, again, before we leave, if any of you are interested, there are those links in the chat. Um, and just keep your eye out. Uh, we'll be having more Science Cafe events in the future. Hope to see you all there. And thank you to WBGU TV for hosting this event and providing all the technology to make this uh, happen so effectively and so smoothly, so beautifully. Well done. All right. Well, thank you all.